After the Second World War, the U.S. starts to build its naval aviation arm in a big way. In early 1950, Lieutenant Tom Hudner transfers to Fighter Squadron 32, VF-32, at Quonset Point Naval Air Station. One morning, as Hudner arrives at the air station, he walks through the bustling hangar, the sounds of mechanics working on aircraft filling the air. He heads to the locker room to settle in. As he places his belongings in his locker, he hears a noise from the washroom. Shortly after, Ensign Jesse Brown steps out, adjusting his uniform. Hudner, noticing Brown, introduces himself with a friendly smile. Hi, I'm Tom Hudner, he says, extending his hand. Brown shakes it and introduces himself as Jesse Brown. Hudner quickly realizes that Brown is the only African-American member of the squadron. Despite the potential tension, the two men share a mutual respect. Hudner integrates well into the squadron, which is assigned the powerful and notorious F4U4 Corsairs, nicknamed the Widowmaker due to their reputation for fatal accidents if not handled properly. The squadron's pilots include Marty Good, Bo Lavery, Bill Koenig, and Carol Mooring, each bringing their unique personalities and skills to the team. The squadron is led by Lieutenant Commander Dick Sevely, a seasoned and respected officer. Hudner is paired up with Brown and they start to bond during their training sessions and missions. Brown, who has a reputation for coloring slightly outside the lines and not always being a stickler for rules, demonstrates exceptional skill and bravery, earning Hudner's admiration. Despite the inherent risks and challenges of flying the Corsairs, the squadron trains diligently, pushing their limits and building camaraderie. One day, during a particularly intense training session, Hudner observes Brown executing a daring maneuver that leaves the rest of the squadron in awe. After they land, Hudner approaches Brown with a mixture of concern and admiration. That was impressive, Jesse, Hudner says, but you had me worried there for a second. Brown grins and responds, you know me, Tom. I like to keep things interesting. Through their shared experiences, Hudner and Brown develop a deep friendship, facing the challenges of their demanding roles together, and preparing for the inevitable trials that lie ahead in the skies. After Brown's car breaks down one evening on his way home, Hudner offers him a ride. This becomes a regular occurrence, and through these rides, Hudner and Brown's bond deepens. One afternoon, Hudner drives Brown home and meets his wife, Daisy, and their young daughter, Pam. The Browns welcome Hudner warmly, and he is struck by the strong, loving family they have despite the challenges they face. Inside the Brown home, Hudner observes the signs of struggle, especially with their racist neighbors. Usually, Jesse uses his unique coping mechanism to deal with the pressure from racism. Standing in front of the bathroom mirror, Jesse shouts racist abuse at himself, using the hatred and prejudice he faces as fuel for his determination and focus before missions. The squadron receives orders to transfer to the USS Leyte, commanded by Captain T. U. Sisson, which is being deployed to the Mediterranean Sea to deter Soviet aggression. Before they leave, Daisy privately speaks to Hudner. With worry in her eyes, she asks Hudner to promise that he will look out for Jesse. Hudner, understanding the gravity of her request, assures her that he will be there for Jesse. The squadron, VF-32, undergoes their carrier qualification tests with the Corsair USS Leyte. The tension is high as each pilot takes their turn. Hudner executes his landing flawlessly, scoring perfectly. When it's Brown's turn, nerves and pressure get the best of him. He misses his first landing approach, causing everyone on deck to hold their breath as he executes a risky fly around. Although he successfully lands on his second attempt, the superior officers admonish him for the near mishap, a stark contrast to Hudner's perfect score. On the carrier, Life magazine arrives to profile Jesse, highlighting his unique status as the only African-American aviator on the ship. During the interview, Jesse remains steadfast, refusing to be drawn into discussions about his struggles as an African-American. He emphasizes his commitment to his job and his duty to serve the nation as a naval aviator. Despite his professionalism, the attention he receives draws ire and resentment from some of his fellow officers and sailors. One particular Marine takes pleasure in harassing Jesse, 
making his life on the carrier even more difficult. This Marine's taunts and provocations are relentless, yet Jesse refuses to stand up to him, opting instead to maintain his composure and focus on his responsibilities. Hudner watches these interactions with growing concern, recognizing the heavy burden Jesse carries both in and out of the cockpit. As the USS Leyte sails towards the Mediterranean, the squadron members brace themselves for the unknown challenges ahead, while Hudner keeps a vigilant eye on his friend, honoring the promise he made to Daisy. As the USS Leyte continues its voyage, the perils of naval aviation become tragically apparent. One day, while attempting a routine landing on the carrier, squadron member Carol Mooring encounters a fatal accident. His Corsair flips and crashes onto the deck after he pushes the throttle too fast, contrary to the landing instructions. The sudden loss shakes the squadron, and Hudner, deeply troubled, questions why Mooring didn't follow the landing procedures. Brown listens to Hudner's concerns but offers a different perspective. He explains that rigid adherence to instructions isn't always possible or beneficial. He shares his own experiences, revealing that if he had solely followed the directions given to him, his career would have ended prematurely due to the numerous racist superior officers who didn't want to see him succeed. This conversation deepens Hudner's understanding of Brown's resilience and the complexities of their profession. During a shore leave in Cannes, France, the squadron experiences a lighter, more surreal moment. Brown encounters the renowned actress Elizabeth Taylor on the beach. Charmed by his charisma and the novelty of his story, Taylor invites the entire squadron to an exclusive casino event, much to the delight and astonishment of Brown's peers. At the casino, however, they face an ugly reminder of racial prejudices. The doorman initially refuses to believe that Elizabeth Taylor would invite an African-American to the establishment. After some negotiation and clarification from Elizabeth herself, they are allowed inside. Elizabeth graciously invites the pilots to join her at her table, where they find the Marines from their carrier, including the one who has been harassing Brown. The night escalates when Hudner, fueled by alcohol and pent-up frustration, gets into a heated argument and then a physical altercation with the harassing Marine. The situation cools down only when Brown intervenes. He firmly tells Hudner that while he appreciates his support, he does not want him fighting his battles. Instead, Brown asks simply for Hudner's presence and understanding. Amidst these tensions, a touching gesture from the African-American crewman aboard the Leyte offers a poignant contrast. They present Brown with an expensive watch, a symbol of their deep respect and admiration for his courage and trailblazing achievements. This gift not only acknowledges Brown's significance as a role model but also solidifies his status as an integral and highly esteemed member of the naval community. The following day, the squadron aboard the USS Leyte received sobering news, war had erupted between North and South Korea. As tensions escalated, the Leyte received urgent orders to redeploy and support South Korean forces. In November 1950, VF-32 arrived in Korea amidst unsettling reports that Chinese troops had entered the war on the North Korean side, significantly bolstering the North Korean efforts and pushing American forces back. Upon arrival, VF-32 is tasked with a critical mission, to destroy a pair of strategic bridges on the Yalu River, which forms the border between China and North Korea. These bridges are vital as they serve as the main access points for Chinese troops entering Korea. Previous attempts by B-29 bombers to destroy these bridges had failed, leaving the task to the squadron. Although they are given strict orders to engage only on the Korean side of the border to avoid escalating tensions with China, the urgency of the mission weighs heavily on everyone. Lieutenant Commander Sevely gathers his squadron, emphasizing the mission's importance and the non-negotiable directive to bring everyone back home safely, no matter what challenges they face. The pilots nod in understanding, the weight of responsibility clear in their expressions. As they approach the Yalu River, the squadron splits into groups. Brown and Hudner take on the task of fending off a MiG-15 fighter jet that has intercepted them. Despite the high stakes, they manage to hold off the MiG-15, showcasing their piloting prowess and teamwork. Meanwhile, the rest of the squadron focuses on the bridges. They launch their attack, but only one bridge is successfully destroyed the other remains stubbornly intact. Faced with intense anti-aircraft fire from the Chinese side, 
Hudner makes the difficult decision to call for a retreat to avoid further casualties. However, Brown, driven by a fierce determination to complete the mission and perhaps sensing the critical impact of their task on the war effort, makes a bold decision. Disobeying Hudner's order, he turns his plane around and heads back towards the remaining bridge. In a daring solo attack, Brown descends closer to the bridge, navigating through the barrage of enemy fire. With precise and determined strikes, he successfully hits the crucial points of the bridge, crippling it and effectively cutting off a significant route for the Chinese troops. His actions, while disobedient, underscore his deep commitment to the mission and the efforts of the United Nations forces in Korea. After the mission over the Yalu River, Hudner prepares his after-action report with a complex mix of emotions. He praises Brown for his undeniable bravery and effectiveness in destroying the bridge, yet he also dutifully records that Brown acted against orders. When Brown reads the draft, he expresses a resigned frustration to Hudner, predicting that this incident will be used as a pretext to deny him promotions for the remainder of his career. Hudner, attempting to mitigate the potential repercussions for his friend, tries to revise the report to emphasize Brown's heroic contributions while downplaying his insubordination. However, Brown remains skeptical about the impact this will have on his career trajectory. In a subsequent mission, VF-32 is tasked with providing air support to Marines besieged at the Chosin Reservoir. During this intense operation, Brown's Corsair is hit by gunfire from Chinese soldiers. The damage to his aircraft is severe, and Brown is forced to make an emergency crash landing in a remote mountain clearing in North Korea. From the air, Hudner witnesses Brown's plane go down and sees that although the plane is heavily damaged, Brown appears to be alive but trapped inside his cockpit. Driven by a profound sense of duty and friendship, Hudner makes a split-second decision to crash his own plane in the same clearing. After surviving his own crash landing, Hudner rushes to Brown's side. He successfully puts out a fire in the engine of Brown's Corsair. Despite his efforts, Hudner struggles to free Brown, who is pinned by the wreckage, as time ticks by, Brown's condition worsens. Hudner's frantic attempts to extricate him are interrupted when a Marine Sikorsky helicopter arrives to provide assistance. The rescue team joins Hudner in his efforts, but despite all their attempts, they are unable to free Brown. Brown's injuries are too severe, and he dies in the cockpit. Back on the USS Leyte, the emotional toll of the incident weighs heavily on the squadron. Hudner's commander, after assessing the situation and the risks involved, concludes that it is too dangerous to attempt a recovery of Brown's body from the area, which remains under Chinese control. Instead, the squadron is ordered to carry out a funeral flight over the location where Brown went down. Several months after the tragic events in Korea, Lt. Tom Hudner stands in a solemn ceremony at the White House, a mix of pride and sorrow visible on his face. President Harry Truman presents Hudner with the Medal of Honor. The medal is awarded not just for Hudner's bravery in combat but also for his extraordinary efforts to save his friend and fellow aviator, Jesse Brown. After the ceremony, Hudner, still grappling with his emotions, finds a moment to speak with Daisy. In a quiet, heartfelt conversation, he expresses his deep regret and sorrow for not being able to rescue Jesse. Hudner's voice trembles as he apologizes, wishing he could have done more to bring her husband back alive. Daisy listens intently, showing understanding and quiet strength. She gently reminds Hudner of the promise he made before they left for Korea, not a promise to save Jesse but to be there for him. She reassures Hudner that he fulfilled that promise, emphasizing that Jesse knew he wasn't alone in his final moments. Hudner shares with Daisy that Jesse's final words were declarations of love for his family, revealing the depth of his feelings for her and their daughter. Here. A true story of the heroic African-American pilot will conclude. Despite extensive efforts, Jesse Brown's remains have never been recovered from the rugged mountains of North Korea. The families of Hudner and Brown have remained close friends, honoring the memory of Jesse Brown and the unbreakable bond he shared with Tom Hudner.